Welcome back, everyone, to the conference uh, under the viral shadow networks in the age of technoscience and infection. We are very happy to um, introduce you to our keynote speaker, Roberta Bujani, who is with us from Toronto today. And um, before I present her biographically, I wanted to say that I had the big pleasure in 2018 to meet uh, Roberta at the FEM meeting in Portugal organized by Marta de Menezes and Dalila Honorato. And that was a very special experience. And uh, since then, we have an interesting exchange and we're very happy that she agreed to present the keynote in our conference. I would like to, before she starts, I'd like to give you a little uh, biographical background. So Roberta um, has a PhD in communication and culture from the York University. She is an interdisciplinary artist, a media scholar and curator based in Toronto. She is the co-founder of the Art Science Salon at the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences in Toronto and co-organizer of Laser Toronto. Her recent SSHRC funded research creation project draws on feminist technoscience and on collaborative encounters across the sciences and the arts to investigate emerging life forms exceeding the categories defined by traditional methods of classification. Her artistic work has traveled to arts festivals and to name only a few, we can name Transmediale, Hemispheric Institute, Encuentro, Brazil, and community centers and galleries such as the Free Gallery Toronto, Immigrant Movement International Queens or Museum of Toronto and science institutions, RPI, the Field Institutes, etc. Her writing has appeared on Space and Culture, Cultural Studies, and the Canadian Journal of Communication, among others. She's a research associate at the Center for Feminist Research at York University. With the Art Sci Salon, she has launched a series of experiments in squatting academia by holding exhibitions and events in unconventional spaces and by repopulating abandoned spaces and cabinets across university campuses with sci art installations. She's currently creating in collaboration with Lorella Di Cintio and Cavi, a post pandemic mobile gallery. The first exhibition will feature artworks and scientific objects on the theme of emergent forms of life. Her talk is based on a long term project on viruses titled, I quote, viral cultures, viruses, and viral phenomena across science, technology, and the arts." End of quote. This book has been many years in the making and is a labor of love and a long essay trying to cope with this complicated world of ours. And we're very happy to say, welcome, Roberta. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm very honored to be uh, with you. Uh, this is um, such a treat for me. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm gonna try and um, can I share my screen? So, um, so I just I just want to thank uh, thank you, uh, my host, to um, to have me. Um, I'm a little bit. Um, I'm very excited and I'm also very uh, nervous because this is the first time that I'm presenting uh, this type of work. And uh, uh, as I said, it's been a long time in the making. Um, so bear with me and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope um, there will be a really nice discussion after one. Okay. I'm just gonna start this. Darkness. When everything was just floaty energy in complete darkness. Maybe you remember which choices you made here. How much did you dare to risk in order to grow? How much darkness did you observe? Do you remember? So um, these are the initial uh, words of the short play Influenza, Theater of Glowing Darkness uh, by artist Christine uh, Ropsdorf, um, displayed at the Biennale of Venezia in the Danish Pavilion in 2017. Uh, the installation consists uh, of a large um, installation merging with the uh, surrounding jardine. Sorry, I'm just uh, taking myself out because I don't like to see myself. Okay, sorry. 
it's disrupting. <laughs> And the installation consists of a large installation uh, merging with the surrounding giardini and a play. To access this play, visitors uh, were invited into a pitch dark room. Uh, the room uh, then was softly lit by a scheme of lights that reflected and bounced around through what seemed like a sort of maze of glasses. Um, the dialogue was built between uh, Dark River, Midwife and Synth. And the play explored darkness as a condition of healing and reconciliation, an integral part of the natural cycle of death and rebirth. So the installation had a, an uncanny resemblance to a virus-like creature. Its boundaries could not be defined precisely. It's... Um, um, its interdisciplinary structure contained uh, sculpture and architecture, immersive theater and sound. By roaming that space, visitors enacted and strengthened the connections between its parts. The installation powerfully addressed the fear of the unknown. The unknown as uh, uh, something that is not yet known as something that is feared because it cannot be yet or ever controlled, as something that is so entangled with the world that the elements contributing to it are unknown, as something that um, one single discipline or method or technology cannot grasp, grasp uh, um, is, uh, is entirety, uh, unless other disciplines, methods and technologies join uh, forces together. So uh, we are all familiar with viruses and their reputation. And here uh, I, will, I will tell you where I'm going with this. So why, why am, I, am I saying this to you? Um, so in the realm of computing, uh, computers, uh, computer viruses are self-replicating strings of code with potential uh, to host operating systems, disrupt uh, networks and those who depend on their smooth functioning. As biological agents, viruses are, um, and I quote, small obligate intracellular parasites, which by definition contain either a RNA or DNA genome surrounded by a protective virus-coded um, protein coat, unquote. Viruses are mostly innocuous, but a few are known to cause harm among uh, humans and animals, and therefore they are feared and antagonized. So viruses have an intimate relation with the unknown because of their complex and multi-state making, as well as their capricious behavior. With their surprising articulations, viruses are a symbol of today's struggle to contain complexity. And in fact, uh, whether informational or biological, they're perceived in materiality bec because they are uh, submicroscopic or because they are defined by code. Um, and they're non-linear and uh, relational uh, behavior because they are only amplified through advantageous connections and through a complicated series of intersections, have puzzled many scientists in uh, computing and in biology. I'm still here. <laughs> Viruses share uh, material and conceptual qualities thanks to various processes of simplification. So for example, the idea that viral videos spread like viruses. And, and because of, of the unknowns and the uncertainties that they carry, uh, these qualities have proliferated beyond the limited scientific and technological areas of competence, easily crossing the realms of information and biology, proliferating through popular culture and the arts. So in other words, um, viruses and their qualities uh, turned out to be unexpectedly productive and well, um, viral. I call all these myriad vectors, connections and non-linear uh, dynamicity, including uh, the emotional responses and stereotypes that have allowed these viral qualities to hop from information to biology, from specific uh, phenomena to a set of uh, trends of uh, uh, practices, the viral. Um, despite uh, many popular assumptions that see viruses as self-contained uh, agents, viruses are profoundly entangled 
uh, borderless, um, leaky, and uh, unpredictable, and they're also multi-state. Um, the viral connects uh, viruses through material and metaphorical elements, which are circulated, exchanged, and bounced back and forth ac across domain. Uh, for instance, the viral is at work uh, when um, research methods are shared across information and biology, uh, or uh, when metaphors and uh, imaginary about one type of viral phenomenon reappear cyclically or spread worldwide. Um, the viral causes uh, pain and empathy, selfishness and solidarity, fear and insecurity. Uh, the viral traverses physical bodies, uh, news media and digital networks, and it turns into memes and refrains, aggressive marketing or artistic expression. Uh, the viral both produces and, we will see, could help cope with the unknown. I see here the arts as crucial contributors uh, to the comprehension, the dissemination and the taming of the viral. And I put taming into scare quotes. Uh, as we see later, uh, by uh, formulating approaches that are not necessarily tied to discipline specific um, definitions, artistic work reveals and suggests new ways to grasp the elusive nature of viruses and other complex phenomena. Uh, in a techno scientific world intent at measuring, predicting, and controlling everything uh, with minute. Um, uh, accuracy, the arts reassert the role of affect and the emotional in the reading of viral phenomena. So I want to focus on a few aspects through uh, which the viral becomes manifest. Um, first, uh, how the qualities of the viral exist across information and biology by virtue of its own material nature and the already strong connection between the two domains. Uh, second, how uh, the viral uh, reveals itself um, in the form of collective epidemiologies as popular narratives and as more intimate symbols speaking to um, somehow buried in histories. And third, and finally, how the viral simultaneously embodies and feeds on uncertainty. Uncertainty is generated as a, a product of the hurdles that uh, scientific research encounter uh, to uh, pin down, fully comprehend, and tame viruses, as well as the result of the simplifications enabling uh, the viral to cross so many boundaries. Uncertainty becomes uh, here simultaneously something that must be battled and something that could be embraced. So first part, Crossing boundaries. During a 2014 interview on uh, uh, WNYC on the media, Priscilla Wald described how in the 80s, the sudden appearance of HIV AIDS effectively undermined the somewhat arrogant confidence of modern medicine in its um, ability to annihilate all viruses. From being triumphant and optimistic, the attitude of health professionals and scientists engaged in the fight against uh, um, uh, infectious diseases became um, uncertain and tentative. So the idea of a virus causing outbreaks with dangerous effects became a powerful metaphor in discussing other subjects, such as the spread of terrorist cells or um, uh, the epidemic of uh, uh, diabetes, for instance. And of course, it was in that very period that uh, computer viruses became uh, um, a hot uh, topic as well. So in, 2000, in, uh, sorry, in, in 1984, <laughs> Fred Cohen formulated his uh, famous uh, um, uh, definition, uh, which was a working definition uh, of the computer virus as a program that can infect other programs by modifying them to include a possibly evolved version of themselves. Now, um, for him, computer and biological viruses had material affinity because the technical ability of computer viruses to infect and reproduce, thanks to uh, the assistance of a host, somehow mirrored 
several uh, abilities uh, that were also manifested by biological viruses. But the two also had a, a less obvious connection, uh, that is computer code like DNA in biology could be interpreted as a principal building block of informational life. And uh, um, uh, what uh, uh, Cohen did was he um, uh, created a working definition, that is a, a definition that was not very specific uh, and not very uh, technical. But it is this, I think that this very absence of a specificity somehow implicitly promoted the extension of the term viruses uh, the term uh, virus to other coded agents is like an old malware, like for example, wars, worms or spyware or ransomware. And uh, furthermore, it contributed to fuel some well-known uh, collective imaginary that draws comparisons between and unifies all types of viruses. Uh, but of course, the uh, historical events triggering this comparison between bi the biological and the informational comes from much earlier. Um, there has been, of course, uh, since uh, 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 after the Second World War, a very promiscuous dialogue or an implosion, as Arroway, uh, Donna Arroway calls it, between information and biology. So. Um, the division between information uh, traditionally associated with control and biology, which was uh, traditionally linked to, to uh, complexity, had already dissolved um, by 1984, thanks to converging uh, conceptions of the nature of the two, but also thanks to the foundation of cybernetics and the discovery of the DNA, and also some uh, uh, deliberate advocacy by uh, people like Wiener or von Neumann or Shannon and Weaver, who um, um, clearly tried to establish that a direct link uh, between the two. So uh, the pervasiveness of technologies that came after um, uh, that collect information as discrete data and digitize the biological uh, to make it machine readable have only intensified since. Um, so disciplines such as bioinformatics and synthetic biology or uh, the more recent um, engineering turn in biology, all of these confirm the extent to which biology is translated into quantified uh, computational material. Uh, but the analysis, of course, have worked also the other way around because the notion of life and intelligence have inspired the computer too. And of course, uh, these exchanges work for viruses as well. So we have, for instance, in the mid 90s, uh, people like uh, Forrest, uh, Hofmeyer, and Sumayaji who introduced an um, early uh, computer immunology model. So this model focused on building an artificial immune system to protect the computer networks based on immunological, immunological principles uh, coming from the biological and the biological sciences. So the computer immunology approach has uh, become uh, favored by those in security research seeking to understand the dynamics that regulate computer viruses and to produce antivirus software. Um, and this is like a quote that I really uh, like, and uh, it really puzzled me. Uh, here, Forrest at a certain point asks how this approach, uh, uh, this immunological approach, could be recirculated back into the biological sciences and in understanding the functioning of all complex systems. So uh, I quote, if we set out to engineer a protective system that operates successfully in an environment with some of the same constraints as uh, those faced by the immune system, what components would we need? And what would we need them for? To what extent would these components resemble the natural immune system? So in this case, a biological process is um, used to build an artificial environment. Uh, so the opposite process is also true. Uh, think about biological viruses uh, uh, and the way they are visualized, for instance. Um, we usually use an electron microscope, which renders, and, uh, which render, renders a pre-prepared biological specimen uh, placed in a vacuum chamber as a black and white refraction. So electron micrographs, uh, um, 
uh, well, the early one, uh, of course, were not digitized, but the one uh, that we see today are already existing on the screen. They don't stay there for long. They are actually subjected to a um, series of digitalization processes that uh, um, uh, end up uh, um, uh, creating some hybrids between uh, uh, the biological and the informational. So say, uh, these are very famous uh, visualization uh, mod models of, uh, of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. One is by Alisa Eckert on the uh, left, uh, which is, super, is the super popular one that, that was created uh, for the CDC. And the second one on the right is by uh, Veronica Falconieri Ace. Uh, it's a 3 model, 3D model of the virus uh, produced for, uh, uh, for Scientific America in July 2020. Uh, so in order to be uh, visually uh, legible and comprehensible, um, uh, these images um, had to be uh, to exist. So uh, viruses in this case had to exist as digital biological hybrids and as composite objects. Uh, in other words, uh, they were built by combining different data sets and research findings and from different labs, actually, on um, different sides of the world and uh, processed through a number of applications. Uh, the models that we see in magazines and journals and the models that you see here are images where information and biology are already seamlessly combined. Thierry Bardini argues that, um, and I quote, uh, models have become reality in the making as they allow us to simulate unfamiliar problems by replacing the unfamiliar with the familiar. Okay. Um, so this sentence, turning the unfamiliar into the familiar, there seems to be a preoccupation in making the rendition of viruses as models and illustrations a bit more familiar to us. Models and renditions make viruses simplified as too much information would be difficult to extract. But uh, this simplification or sort of geometrification, so to say, also makes it easier to draw comparisons between different realms and to allow generalizations about viruses to persist. The apparent clarity produced by this generalization also is done to acknowledge rules and obligations that govern scientific and technical knowledge. These representations are the product of conventional knowledge, established uh, scientific protocols and stylistic conventions that are built on top of each other. But they also inevitably retain uh, preconceived popular culture and historical ideas about viruses, including those causing anxieties. Um, and you can see from the, the, the colors that are being used, like uh, bright colors, red, uh, um, uh, psychedelic, like, uh, like um, bright green, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the most interesting elements really find all models in their portrayals as simple objects uh, uh, emerging from a void. So you see here that, um, uh, from uh, uh, images uh, of viruses like in a blur, like a rather blurred, you can see that they become more and more um, sharp. And at the end, the model is portrayed in isolation. And this is also carried uh, into um, uh, artworks um, by models and also artworks. Uh, so here are two radically different images and from different and uh, made with different media because one is the work of inter interdisciplinary artist uh, uh, Luke Jeram and the other one is uh, from designer and programmer Alex Draculesco. These two images are two, uh, uh, so one is a sculpture of course from uh, um, Jeram's uh, Glass Microbiology which is a series and the other one is from another series called Mal Malwares. Um, so um, I'm not going to describe them too much, but both are, um, uh, so the, the, you see the isolation of the virus, um, which is a sort of Petri dish view, really, uh, where the geometric forms, the colors, or the absence of colors, in the case of Jerome, to draw attention to the artificiality of the use of colors in visualization, 
So, but all these items demonstrate the extent to which methods and conventional forms of representation are pre uh, preserved in radically different rendition of viruses. So in both, in both cases, the making familiar acquires a crucial significance for opposite reason. So generalizations here are used out of necessity and as a convenient move uh, to either construct a um, material tangible item where there is no uh, original one, such, such as in the case of drug scope, um, uh, strings of code that are um, pieced together to create an image here, or to highlight the way in which many elements composing viruses are manipulated and constructed to uh, direct the viewer's perception uh, of a certain uh, of a certain entity, as in the case of Jero. I'm going to move uh, to number two, epidemiologies. Uh, the viral uh, travels thanks to human and non-human material and media traffic. Epidemiology uh, is uh, the subject that uh, is the discipline that studies the incidence and recurrence of uh, uh, given diseases among the population. Outbreak narratives, uh, as uh, uh, Priscilla Wald uh, teaches us, mark the evolving story of disease based on repetitions, recurring tropes, and other narrative uh, formulas. Here, uh, outbreak narratives uh, generated by epidemiological analysis and media coverage of pandemics from homogeneous uh, perceptions of epidemics and infectious diseases. Uh, this makes the root of transmission visible and help epidemiologists anticipate and manage the course of the outbreak. But um, this is also a top-down approach because scientists and the media are the ones that regulate uh, the distribution of these narratives. And uh, somehow, in, in a very biopolitical way, facilitating the delineation of uh, the membership and scale of the population. So uh, Albert narratives are somehow uh, coming from an hegemonic uh, perspective. They include metaphors of war, uh, which we've seen in the last few months, uh, uh, words like attack, uh, penetration, and other vocabulary evoking aggression. They include um, assumptions about carriers, about the vulnerable and the poor, um, uh, the narratives uh, live in recurring objects such as masks or vials or syringes and animals uh, such as birds, bats, pigs, or other scary bugs and also funny monsters that live in our computers. So they are uh, also perpetuated by iconic images and cinematography. Um, I'm going to show you uh, this uh, uh, iconic uh, uh, map of COVID-19, uh, which was circulated right uh, when the pandemic started. Uh, and uh, it was created by John Hopkins um, uh, lab. Um, it, it has become very uh, popular, not because of its accuracy, because there's a lot of other maps that are accurate, but because of it, it because it is emotionally arousing. In fact, the user um, so the use of terser colors in other maps, like um, say for example, the WHO uh, uh, map that uses like I think some like blue and, and violet, um, they might uh, look a little bit more authoritative because they're coming from a big institution. Um, and, and also the, the neutral palette that they use is actually typical of an authoritative uh, of rhetorical style. Uh, but uh, this map, went viral and the, and the WHO went, did not go viral, as a matter of fact. Uh, but this is because the background, the, the, the John Sopsin's ba black background and saturated red symbols connote danger and urgency. They really hit uh, the viewer immediately. So, uh, and here, uh, I see that there's a comparison to be made with computer viruses. Uh, but um, I wanted to, to show you this because uh, something has happened uh, it, with time. Uh, so many security and antivirus companies, uh, such as, for example, Carpesti Lab, just to name a few, have produced uh, uh, computer epidemiolog epidemiolog epidemiological maps. Uh, this has been uh, done since the late 90s. Uh, 
and uh, uh, often they have uh, mimicked uh, maps created by the CDC and the WHO. And you can see one, uh, the one uh, by F Secure in 2008 um, on uh, the left. Uh, there are goals uh, where epidemiology, epidemiologically inspired. Uh, to, uh, they were made to identify concentration of multiple threats, uh, their spreads, and their trajectory uh, to determine uh, which area to monitor uh, the most. But um, at a certain point, the tone of urgency of the early 2000s um, has been substituted by a more playful note, uh, play, playful tone. As you see in the, the uh, um, image on the right, which is a screenshot from the Karpinski's lab, Cyber Threats Real-Time Map. And this from 2021. Uh, you see that their design and narrative, um, uh, the design and narrative have become closer uh, to a video game than uh, epidemiological map. The intensification of online activity, as well as the increasing popularity of mobile devices and the ubiquity of Internet of Things devices, for instance, have caused security threats to really diversify. So you can no longer uh, portray, um, um, make maps that portray uh, terrifying single worms with uh, memorable names like All of You or My Zoom, threatening entire networks. Uh, but uh, right now, um, uh, you have many different threats. Um, so with their uh, color coding and their comparison between um, uh, cyber threat, medical emergency, and terrorist threats, uh, maps um, could uh, uh, work um, as, um, um, as, as, as very good comparative comparisons. But at this point, um, there, there are too many. And so it is a very difficult to, to recreate these maps. So maps have kind of uh, um, um, withdrawn from uh, the rhetoric that used to be uh, um, in place uh, before. So, but with their color coding and their comparison between cyber threat, medical emergency, and also terrorist threat maps, very efficient in circulating uh, what I called before the <laughs> excuse me, outbreak narratives by assuming that the consumer is uh, somehow homogeneous. Uh, but what about a, a diversified personal and emotional reactions to contagion? And what about affective epidemiologies? That is epidemiologies that affect the senses and also evoke uh, uh, more um, intimate and visceral uh, personal uh, effect. Okay, so um, this is an image, this is like several images from uh, 2013 uh, exhibition called Ambient Plague by uh, Canadian Elaine Whitaker. Um, the uh, I wish I could show you uh, better pictures of the environment because uh, literally the uh, viewer, uh, once entering the, the gallery, was uh, um, literally um, in, um, aggressed or literally uh, filled with a profusion of petri dishes containing stills from well recognizable pandemic sci fi movies like. Outbreak, Contagion, the Andromeda Strain, 28 Days Later, and, and, and others. And nearby other uh, petri dishes um, contained unpainted uh, uh, reproduction of infectious pathogens such as HIV, rabbits, uh, and other. The installation was titled, I caught it at the movies. Um, and then there was another uh, nearby installation which displayed syringes, test tubes, bundles of strings, and other objects evoking uh, infectious diseases, contagion, and viral agents, and all covering the surfaces and connecting the petri dishes and the objects. It was a layer of um, cultured aloe bacteria and crystallized agar, which uh, to me, it was a reminder of the interconnectedness, the dynamic uh, behavior, and the pervasiveness of all pandemics. 
the pairing of uh, such a variety of items uh, provided an opportunity for the spectator to contemplate the various symbols of infectious diseases and their very own inability to disentangle aesthetic elements and scientific data, technical information, and popular culture, uh, the characteristics of individual pathogens and uh, their generalized and vaguely defined pandem pandemic uh, qualities. Uh, the uh, disappearing uh, boundaries of and between the objects of display and the cinematic narratives not only conjured up uh, reflections about the continuity of science and fiction, but also the power to generate a range of different and often alternating feelings. Uh, in fact, these petri dishes may or may not unify a population immersed in the same culture. Individuals may ascribe uh, different meanings to the same objects, for instance, uh, based maybe on uh, their experience or perceive the danger of a virus. But they could also work in distinct uh, clues from uh, uh, historical epidemics that are long gone, but have been passed on and survived uh, in the collective imaginary for many years, losing their specific meaning and becoming really just with frames that uh, emerge every time a pandemic is called um, or uh, referenced. And I wanna show you another um, exhibition. Uh, this was from 2019, but, uh, and it's from uh, Ruth Carpand, uh, who is a, a, a plains uh, Cree. Um, uh, she opened her series of trading at the Art Gallery of Oshawa in um, Ontario. Uh, her installation featured the giant viruses. You can really maybe see a little bit, but uh, they were made with a specific technique, which is a traditional beading technique. Uh, when European settlers um, established themselves in the Americas, they brought in, in, in inexpensive beads uh, and they traded them for um, much more valuable fur. So uh, this was a little bit uh, of a dishonest trading, but the uneven exchange also brought deadly infectious diseases such as influenza, measles, smallpox, typhus, uh, cholera, scarlet fever, and many others. And similarly to Whitaker's movie shots, cat hands um, images of viruses and bacteria are familiar images, evoking those very outbreak narratives described by Wald. But here, the viral has exceeded its direct effects, as it is um, not limited to infectious diseases, but it refers to the viral like expansion of uh, uh, settlers and colonial Canada and their unfair trading, as well as the diffuse emotional, physical, and material impact that this expansion brought to the indigenous population. The viral here comes to inhabit uh, the memories and symbols of Kathan's ancestors. Ancestors. Ah, three, uh, it's not two, three, the last one, appropriation. So, um, in their analysis of uh, network culture, Alex Galloway and Eugene Tucker mentioned uh, that um, one of the common assumptions regarding viruses is that they appear to spiral out of control. But, can I quote from them, calling such instances accidents or networks out of control is a misnomer. They are not networks that are broken, but networks that work too well. They are networks that beyond uh, one's capacity to control them or even comprehend them. So in other words, the way viruses behave and spread, uh, the way they exist in nature or within uh, digital networks is in conflict with the attempt to control and dominate them. Uh, Roberto Esposito reminds us that either life holds politics back, pinning it to its impassable natural limit, or on the contrary, it is life that is captured and prey to a politics that strains to envision its innovative potential, in prison, its innovative potentials. Uh, the distributed and unpredictable spread of biological and computer viruses and the viral uh, on its own uh, makes it harder to control them. But control 
binary thinking and anthropocentric opportunism are here to stay. They're all part of the same box, really. Uh, in fact, uh, the successful dissemination of the barrel, thanks to easy analogies, may encourage the appropriation of barrel qualities. The barrel is attributed, um, as we know, to barrel marketing, to barrel videos, or expressions like going viral. But here, the barrel is selectively appropriated, as if to um, imprison it, to tame it, uh, to turn something that is unpredictable by nature into something that is controllable, something that is perceived as negative into something that is positive. Uh, so my question is, can the unpredictable and capricious behavior of the viral be also embraced? So I'm not here suggesting that uh, to embrace the viral or to become viral, one must passively accept it, but one could welcome it as a way to cope with uh, the complexities of unpredictable events. So lacking strategies uh, to flesh out these events in traditional ways, as we've done, for example, with um, um, climate change, uh, we must now turn to other tactics. For some artists and practitioners, becoming viral then may help them describe futures of coexistence with the viral, and for others, it may turn into new ways of existence altogether. So what does it mean to go viral here? I'm drawn here to uh, Joseph Nekvatal's uh, Viratwo, uh, which is a new topological cognitive vision of connection between the computed virtual and the uncomputed uh, corporeal world. So this definition is very much in line with the idea that information and biology, virtual and actual, biology and information do not lie in well separated or unbridgeable containers, but are situated, as Stephanie Fischel argues, in a continuous or mutual becoming, a what co-production or co-evolution of people and things, unquote. Uh, enacted the virtual in his art, uh, artistic computer uh, robotic assisted uh, acrylics. In this um, works, an artificial like an artificial life virus created with the help of Stefan Sikora, uh, Sikora and uh, sometimes operated by a robotic device, invades, transforms, consume, and ultimately remake uh, the original images. And in the background here, there's one of those images uh, remade by uh, the virus. Nekvatal here refuses to exploit the selected qualities of the virus. The virus here acts independent of any human intervention, making its way across the digital canvas and following its own programmed logic. Uh, another artist who's been uh, um, um, engaging with the viral is Payin Ling. Um, she has been researching uh, the relationship between human beings and viruses since 2015 and then before, and she's been in dialogue with virologists, humanists, and performers. So she built installations, assembled uh, board games, staged uh, uh, video performances and group uh, socials. She wrote a cookbook, and now she's actually knitting uh, a virus. Uh, so her works uh, come down to two important questions. How do humans coexist with their viruses? Is it possible to domesticate the virus? Or, uh, Speculative design narratives imagine futures where viruses are incorporated into everyday activities. So you have on the left an image uh, from uh, smallpox syndrome, um, where she imagines a future where Western biotechnologies merge with the Eastern philosophy around uh, medicine. And I quote from her, instead of combating the pathogens, the focus uh, shifts uh, towards uh, how to enhance hum in human immune system for unpredicted infectious diseases. Quote. For her multi-part series of, of installations titled uh, Tames to Tame, and on the right you, uh, you see a screenshot of the performance, uh, she invited dancer and choreographer uh, Xin Yu Chang uh, portrayed here 
to uh, demonstrate special exercises to avoid contact with surfaces infected uh, by a virus. However, the sinuous and elegant moves of the dancer are neither aggressive nor fearful, and she appears to be dancing with the virus, gently avoiding the surfaces where it potentially hides and uh, using caution in order to be able to coexist side by side with the virus without trying to kill it or rejecting, re rejecting its experience. And I want to conclude with this example. In 20, 20, 2012, uh, Italian interdisciplinary artist Salvatore Iaconesi was diagnosed with brain cancer. As doctors dispensed a lot of advices that felt to him orders to follow the typical standardized path of other patients, he found himself caught in a medical system intent to measure, visualize, and examine his condition only. So basically, he felt, uh, by his own word, his own tumor. He also realized that uh, all the examinations that had been uh, performed on him um, and that uh, provided impor important information about his condition have been extracted and stored away from him in a format that he could not share freely. So his reaction became a long-term performance journey uh, that is lasting to these days. He, um, uh, is actually undergoing uh, this with his uh, working in life partner, uh, Oriana Persico. And uh, it was initially called La Cura, but I think even if maybe they do not um, um, draw the comparisons between the two, but like the current project that they are doing is very much coming from this. And, and it is morphing into a, a new philosophy of living and being with others. Um, so this, this um, journey extends well beyond uh, medical treatment or data sharing. So initially, in order to demedicalize this condition, he released his medical data online and turned to the larger community. So his endeavor acquires here a much more profound significance in the context of understanding the virus. Um, his request, in fact, was not just of a medical nature, but had a uh, rather symbolic value drawn by a need to open up cancer source code as a biopolitical right of healing aimed at redefining concepts such as disease and cure to reappropriate the condition of being ill and to foster a society that recognizes disease as a complex experience, one felt by social bodies as much as individual bodies. So this story um, far exceeds um, um, issues of information gathering and dissemination, issues of disease and contagion, risk and control. This act of sharing is not meant to disseminate information with the purpose of receiving more. This act of sharing pro projects outside, far away from a circle of intimate friends or trusted acquaintances. It has welcomed a precarious and indeterminate space, a new open-ended living, just like the seed that we saw in the beginning in Christine um, Robster's uh, theater piece, uh, uh, as open to, si to um, darkness and to the unknown. Uh, the gesture of sharing in both, uh, is both an embodiment of the viral and a gesture of care. I want to remind you what uh, Maria Blabella Casa explains uh, uh, about caring. She says that caring is everything that we do to maintain, continue, and repair our world so that we can leave it, we can live in it as well as possible. So, um, to conclude, what does it mean to, empray, empray, to embrace the viral today? The pandemic uh, brought in physical and emotional discomfort, as well as a ling lingering and diffuse sense of uncertainty. But what is the direction that we need to take? Should we return to a hopefully controlled back to normal or move, move on and imagine an unimaginable future? Can we open up to a future where care can be achieved? Okay, I finished. Thank you so much for the show now. Thank you very much, Roberta. Thank, thank you. It was wonderful.
Um, so many ideas and questions. <laughs> um, and I can only phrase them in long, complicated ways because they're so multivalent. Um, let's start with this idea with visualization and models and representation, which always have this level of simplification. Um, so they're meant originally to enable us to understand discrete and minute details, uh, but often take without or ig intentionally ignoring ooh, the situation, uh, say the environment or the ecology that's around them, you know, by showing the virus itself instead of the whole environment uh, or even misunderstanding its its own purpose. Uh, all this uh, these visualizations and models often, they actually remind me in some way of the 16th century religious propaganda uh, where, you know, these, these, the, when the printing press came out and, and all these images appeared uh, and were, you know, uh, and were mass produced so that everyone could have them. And, uh, you know, so it, it's part of this already a kind of situation we have uh, of too much information, um, uh, which then just overloads and confuses people, maybe creating actually a space for narratives of disinformation, which have their own purposes. Uh, you know, so the, as much information that is put out there to help us deal with COVID, uh, we still get people who are insisting on uh, 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 ivermectin as the answer instead of the vaccination. Um, so I, I, I'm wondering uh, what role does this visualization and models in an unintentionally, or in some cases intentionally, play with um, uh, leading to over-information, disinformation, uh, and, you know, basically creating immense amounts of noise instead of the simplification they set out to do. Ah, this is a very uh, complex question, actually. And I really don't have an answer for this. Um, um, it's, I mean, this, this also, also has to do with uh, science communication and the way, um, on the one hand, scientists and, and those people who are doing uh, public relation for them uh, assume um, to be the uh, type of literacy that the public has. So the assumption that um, uh, the public doesn't have any, any um, knowledge and uh, uh, is just uh, uh, absorbing whatever is given to them. But there's also um, uh, the, the question of, uh, so the scientist has ethics and, and the question for the scientist is how do I represent something that uh, like in, in an accurate way, right? Um, and then there's also the other, the other aspect that I just mentioned um, uh, uh, in my paper, that is um, when you're creating these visualizations, you also need to pay tribute to a long tradition that has been uh, representing viruses or uh, other microscopic uh, organisms uh, like that for a long time. So what are you doing? Are you creating something like completely new and proposing it um, to a public that may or may not be literate? Uh, about these images, or uh, do you so do you break from it uh, with the risk that um, your your stuff is going to be um, completely ignored, or um, do you just play the game that everybody else does, right? And uh, I think one of the problem um, with this information, I, I didn't talk about this information because there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that has been uh, written about it. So I'm like, okay, yeah, people don't already about it. But um, the idea about misinformation, so there's misinformation and disinformation, right? So the idea that, me, so there's a little bit of misinformation and just a tiny bit of disinformation in the sense that um, those people in the know, know that uh, when you're representing a virus, the virus is, is like floating in this like soup of a lot of other stuff, right? But and nonetheless, we are portraying it um, as a single individual thing, um, but this is this is not because we we want like because because uh, uh, the uh, visualizers want to uh, mislead people. Um, this is because of clarity. This is because of traditions, and this is because of and it's also because of rhetoric, because. Uh, uh, we are only influenced, including the scientists, by uh, this idea that, um, um, uh, like, but the ideas, the, the, the assumptions that we make about viruses. So I don't want to rumble more, uh, but um, yeah, I think that the, the issue of misinformation is uh, um, is complicated, um, and um, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Has anybody written about this kind of stuff in terms of the misinformation that has been um, disseminated? I don't know. I think we are still uh, trying to work it. I, I think people are trying to figure it out. I see articles, at least, of uh, analyzing it, but not quite there yet. I don't think we have the distance. Uh, it'll be interesting in 10 years to see what because they do. Because, uh, yeah, because I think uh, you can only approach uh, one uh, um, one subtopic at a time. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about visualization, like before, like in, in the last two minutes, I, I mentioned misinformation, disinformation, uh, the literacy, the um, uh, the science, uh, and the, like it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff that it, it goes into like one specific item. Well, this was really great, Roberto. Also, thank you from my side. This was actually a um, panopticum of, um, um, it was a panopticum and vir uh, cosmology of the virus in the computational, biological, and cultural historical uh, dimensions. Uh, thank you so much. It was so dense. I think we take a lot of ideas also in our final <laughs> discussion, I'm sure. Um, I found various approaches absolutely remarkable. Um, I have a hard time to kind of like come to conclusions or to uh, to, 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 to actually respond to, 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 to the complexities here. I'm, I'm, I'm rather fascinated. Um, I, it just also occurred to me, it became so clear with the examples that you showed us, especially the media visuals of graphs and also the tendency of the quantification and the intensity, of course, in the last one and a half years for obvious reasons, but the usage of graphs, I just had this um, idea, are we actually, I mean, the, the, dichotomy of body and mind, the dichotomy of techno, techne and natur, the, the tradi in, tr in tradition, of course, this is probably all what we want to kind of discuss against here, um, uh, us here, but um, the, 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 the tradition of the dichotomy of division of body and mind. And I just see, it just occurred to me, tell me if I'm wrong, but it occurred to me that maybe with the, the media coverage using these graphs, this is exactly the way where, the, where this traditional uh, um, dichotomy that we actually should break is continued. Um, abstrafic abstrafication, or how can we say that? To keep the virus abstract by numbers and graphs. And then, but at the same time, to keep it abstract as angst, fear, and fear of contagion. And it was so actually revealing, and I found it very, <laughs> I don't know if it's consoling, but very also very great that you uh, uh, um, finished with Bea Casa and the idea of care and the idea of embracing the virus. And, and also the artist examples, uh, especially Peiling and Neshvatal and uh, also um, Elaine uh, showed very much is the openness to embrace the virus, uh, metaphorically, of course. And to, to actually, maybe these are these exactly these steps of breaking this traditional dichotomy I was talking about. The, the thing about um, numbers and uh, um, quantification, I mean, quantification, uh, we probably all know that has a long story and uh, like since the enlightenment, uh, object, like the, Me mechanical objectivity, uh, this is how um, uh, Dustin and Gallison calls it, has been uh, um, uh, really promoting this idea that um, data or numbers uh, um, are neutral and uh, uh, should be uh, taken as a given and uh, the ultimate authority, right? Um, I think that, that it's like this, this idea of quantification um, is uh, a little bit, uh, so a way to 
to um, make things more uh, authoritative. Like for example, I'm, I'm thinking like when, when you were talking about graphs, like I was thinking about all those numbers and those, uh, uh, those crunchy numbers and those uh, um, um, uh, visualization that came out uh, during uh, the pandemic by those, uh, I call them armchair uh, epidemiologists. Um, and those really um, contributed to the uh, misinformation uh, that was around because everybody had their opinion, everybody could um, um, manipulate the data. And it, it was also a demonstration that data are not neutral at all, right? Um, but yeah, the, 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 the idea that, um, so like, so there's two things that are happening right now, and I'm glad that like the pandemic is actually is actually breaking this. So on the one hand, um, the idea that quantification is uh, like God and is uh, is uh, uh, like the uh, ultimate authority has become very vi vi vis visible in this case. But on the other hand, because it has become visible and because there has been so much going on and because we have realized that uh, uh, not all uh, quantification, not all graphs and data um, can predict the future, um, it is somehow a little bit trembling. So we are starting to, to think that maybe we should not to just rely on numbers and numbers are not always uh, saying the truth uh, or they are not always neutral right and exactly i found it so really great that uh, the the moment when you brought in that measles and other infectious diseases were brought in by colonialists and actually um I think even the graphs that we look at it um, in uh, in the news uh, throughout the whole globe, they are so northwestern. They are so they do not represent the world. They do not present the global south. I mean, when I looked at the chart that you showed with Africa, um, it is the measure of where it has been measured, or <laughs> and, and it is it is such a um, um, it's so geopolitical actually. Yeah. yeah, one assumes that because there is no uh, uh, no cases in Africa, uh, it, there are no cases, but like in reality, we don't have any recording because nobody cares, right? <laughs> I think the mixture of having it, it's a very young population and there are very yeah. few tests. I mean, there was something on BBC, but this, somebody said, why are there so few cases but this, in Yemen? And there are so few cases in Yemen because no one is giving tests in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And there are other problems, you know, the healthcare is dealing with other problems in Yemen, a civil war, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, um, it was interesting also that you. Went but these are things that are not specified. Um, so you see a map, and uh, and you you just see numbers, right? But you don't see the specific cases. And I think that uh, Regina uh, uh, Regina has has said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe um, for one final question, it has to. You were bringing in both Joseph Nishvatal and Pei Ying Lin. And so Joseph has used viruses as a creative potential to kind of, you know, take apart images and maybe immerse them into noise, as you would say. Uh, well, Pei Ying Lin also did a, a wonderful piece just as the pandemic was starting uh, to make viral meals. So she researched foods because many, even humans themselves, our genome has been changed by viruses. And not all viruses are, you know, infecting and destroying cells, but some live dormantly inside and, and add to it. And so many creatures uh, on both plants and animals have been changed by, by uh, genetically changed by viruses. And she did research and worked with chefs to cook meals where the vegetables or the shrimp uh, had this, these viral uh, parts, uh, histories that appeared maybe in the coloring of the shrimp or and something like that. So that's again, really interesting way of how, uh, you know, nature has lived with the viruses. Uh, you know, when we have trees, uh, we have plants in our, House plants that have these white colored leaves inside the green, that's usually a virus. And so we like the aesthetics of the virus. And so that would be a, what would be living with the virus from an aesthetic and ethical point of view. Oh, well, this is a big question that I'm asking. I ask myself. Um, 
I'm more than the aesthetic. I mean, in, in an aesthetic way, I mean, all these artists have been um, uh, experimenting with viruses for a long for, for a long time, and and I really admire them for opening up to like for for showing for re revealing um, different aspects of the viral. Um, but uh, going viral as a form of living, um, I think uh, we have a long way to go. And uh, I mean, this is something that I've been I've been thinking about a lot, um, especially um, after I moved to Canada. Um, when I moved to Canada, so before I moved to Canada, everything seemed to be like very, very certain and very like straightforward. But once I moved to Canada and I became an immigrant, I became a um, precarious academic. I became uh, um, a person who chose not to um, be institutionalized as in like being an institution not being <laughs> in a mental hospital but i uh so like um uh, all of these questions um become very real and and, it, and 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 you realize that it is very difficult to embrace the viral because the viral means um embrace something that is open-ended something that um goes a little bit against like you know the auto control that uh, um uh, tucker and galloway um um mentions mention um like you want to tame something that is out of control you don't want to you don't like stuff that is out of control and uh, i think but i think that right now we are dealing with like stuff like climate change and uh, other un like unpredictable weather um so uh, i think that this is the time to to start thinking more in an open-ended way rather than um trying to predict everything because we can't because um the pandemic has actually um demonstrated that we can't predict everything um, and no matter how uh, many technologies and how many uh, techniques we are using to do that, we can only do it partially. Um, and I'm thinking about the, the epidemiological models, for instance, like they are more for they are more made for warning and for um, um, advice or that to give directions than uh, to really predict what is happening. Uh, but this is like the most difficult thing to do because um, our um, like like Western society has grown as um, society that likes to control things. So the viruses, like viruses are teaching us a lot in this case. It's just that like, I don't know if we want to listen. Good final word for that panel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know how many agree with me, but... <laughs> No, it, it, we will discuss this further. I find this so highly in <laughs> interesting and important, but I just see that uh, time uh, typically always in conferences runs faster than normal. So I think yeah. we have to close up uh, this panel with this wonderful, insightful keynote. Thank you so much, Roberta. Thank you. Um, for sharing Thank you so much. I was so honored to be here. <laughs> we will continue the discussion. And now, actually, after a couple of minutes, uh, we will continue at 10 to 5 with our next panel C, Critical Thoughts on Artificial Intelligence. And Roberta, you stay with us. And hopefully, we all meet later, all together in the final discussion at uh, 6.30 CET. Thank you so much, Roberta. Thank you so much.